Rabbi Ben Simmons was fed up with his congregation. So he decided to skip services on Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, and instead go play golf. Moses was looking down from heaven and saw the rabbi on the golf course. He naturally reported it to God. Moses suggested God punish the rabbi severely. As he watched, Moses saw the rabbi Ben Simons playing the best game of golf he had ever played. The rabbi got a hole in one on the toughest hole on the course and then again on the next hole. Moses turned to God and asked, I thought you were going to punish him. Do you call this punishment? God replied, who can he tell? <laughs> I wanted to bring God down to human size for a moment. Because tonight is Kol Nidre. And we begin, of course, tonight and enter into Yom Kippur, in which God is gigantic. Right? God is bigger than we maybe normally think of God on Yom Kippur. And I wanted to remind us to bring God down to our size for a moment. Because it is a strange thing, don't you think, that Yom Kippur, which is a holiday, an observance, focused entirely, or at least significantly, on confession and expressing guilt and trying to fix and repair and mend, that we begin tonight instead with forgiveness. We say to God in just a few minutes, please Forgive us in advance for how we are going to mess up. We try to get an advance on our forgiveness. Now, it's strange also that we ask God for forgiveness at the outset of this holiday because our rabbinic tradition teaches us very clearly that Yom Kippur does not atone for the sins between us and other people. It only atones for the sins between us and God. Yet, here we go and say to God, we pray <clears throat> that all of the oaths and the promises that we make over this next year and that we know we're going to break Please forgive us in advance. So it would seem that there is at least some part of our tradition that would suggest that God can offer some kind of forgiveness for the things that we've done badly to the people, especially people close to us, people we love, people we live with, people who we work with. But imagine for a moment what this conversation looks like or sounds like. Just imagine that you've got God's ear and you can hear God and you say, God, please forgive me. I was a real jerk to my spouse. I was short with her. I was curt. I wasn't giving her the time of day and, you know, Things have been tough at work, and this has kind of become a bit of a pattern. And, you know, God, would you please forgive me? And I imagine that God says, well, yes, my child, I forgive you. I love you. There's nothing, there's truly nothing you can do that will interrupt my love for you, and so I forgive you. The question then that I imagine God might ask is, so what do you think's gonna happen 
if you go home to your spouse and you tell him or her that I've forgiven you for being a jerk and therefore your spouse should just forget about it. Exactly. No answer. And God says, exactly. I think you might have some work to do at home. The truth of the matter is that Yom Kippur is a deep and steady reminder that the work to be done between us and other people can only be done between us and other people. Sit with that for a second. The Talmud teaches that there are three partners in the making of a human being. The father, a mother, and the holy one of blessing. And when we honor our parents, it's like God is saying, it is as if I am dwelling among them and they are honoring me. But when we vex our parents, God says, I am glad not to be living among them they would no doubt drive me crazy as well. That's from the Talmud. Meaning, God, yes, God is everywhere. But so what? When we actually have the work to do between the people who we love, people who we live with, you know, it reminds me of this very, very important film. I'm sure many of you have seen it, but many years ago, it's called Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I don't know if you remember this, but Jessica Rabbit, who is um, sort of a... Imagine Marilyn Monroe on steroids. The people assume of her that she's not a good girl, and so she says this great line, <clears throat> I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. This is how we're drawn. The really important part of Yom Kippur is remembering that this is how we are drawn. We offer Kol Nidre at the outset of Yom Kippur because we are saying to God, we know we are not going to be perfect. We know we're going to be far from perfect. We know we are imperfect, broken, fragile, vulnerable. And we often don't get it right. It's how we're drawn. And so before we even get into the confessional, we seek forgiveness. Teshuva, this path of repentance, this process of turning, of shifting, of changing in our lives so that we can get square with people. The rabbis teach it was actually from, it was actually built in to the fabric of the universe. It was there at the very beginning. Rabbi Yehuda Yechezkel ben Binyamin Haruf Anoth. It's a great name. He said, Come, my students, and I will instruct you in the virtue of repentance. No, my students, the virtue of repentance is very great. Because of its importance, the Holy One made it precede the creation of the world. And then he quotes something from Psalms. 
as a way of sort of proof texting to this idea that teshuva, repentance, was there long before we were even created. Long before there was, an even, even, there was even an earth. Meaning that the notion of teshuva isn't uh, a necess- isn't a correction that we have to deal with if it arises. It is built in. It is this. It is part of this this complicated nature of being these physical bodies that yet have minds that can dream and imagine. We are a mixture of both physical and spiritual. And so our lives are really about discovering how to navigate, how to make decisions, how to say things when they need to be said, and really importantly, how not to say things when they don't need to be said. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, one of the greatest Hasidic spiritual masters, he was the great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. So many of his songs and his poems we find incredibly inspiring. And then to learn that he suffered his entire life from serious depression. It's, It's amazing to realize how hard he worked to keep himself standing, walking, moving through the world. And he has a beautiful meditation, which I'd like to share with you. And I'd like to invite you, if you are so inclined, to close your eyes. You have to judge every person generously. Even if you have reason to think that person is completely wicked, it's your job to look hard and seek out some bit of goodness, some place in that person where he is not evil. When you find that bit of goodness and judge that person that way, you really may raise her up to goodness. Treating people this way allows them to be restored, to come into teshuva. This is why the psalmist taught, just a little bit more and there will be no wicked one. You will look at his place and he will not be there. He tells us to judge one and all so generously, so much on the good side, even if we think they're as sinful as can be. By looking for that little bit, that place, however small within them, where there is no sin, and everyone, after all, has such a place. And by telling him, showing them that that's who they are, or that's at least who they can be, you can change their lives. By seeking out that goodness, you allow teshuva to take its course. By giving space to those who have wronged us, we make it possible, or more possible, that they will pursue their own path of teshuva. But then he goes on. He says, now, my clever friend, now that you know how to treat the wicked and find some bit of good in them, Now go do it for yourself as well. You know what I have taught you. Take care and seek happiness and stay far away from sadness. I've said it to you more than once. Watch out for old man gloom that wants to put you down. Find in yourself that bit of goodness And let that be the light that shines on the rest of you. To the point where that's what you see more than 
all the negative self-talk that we engage in. So much of our conflict with others, so much of it stems from the way others push our particular buttons. We don't get mad or angry at everybody for every little thing or slight they engage in. No. Some things, many things, we can just ignore because they aren't part of our makeup. They don't make us feel uncomfortable. They don't remind us of some thing that happened when we were children or young adults. Some awful relationship we may have had. Some behavior with someone with whom we had an awful relationship. No, no. The things that get us the angriest in our interpersonal relationships are often way more about us than they are about the other person. That isn't to say that people should be able to behave however they want and shouldn't be called to, the, to, call, called, you know, to attention. Of course. But we have to realize that if we wish to be forgiven for our sins, for our transgressions, for the things that we've done wrong, for the way we've lost our minds, our focus, our souls, we have to make room for others to do the same. Because nobody is perfect. I know it sounds like some little aphorism that we like to say, oh, nobody's perfect. But it's true. Nobody's perfect. Imagine that person in your life, maybe from your past or your present, who you think has got it all under control. who's got it fully taken care of. They don't. They don't. They may have more control of how they express it, they don't have it totally buttoned up. So all of us come into this moment in a few minutes, maybe a minute, we will offer Kol Nidre. And we will say to God, please forgive us for what we know we're going to do. Please give us space to breathe. Please allow us to make mistakes, to trip, to fall, to mess up, We say that to God, but really we're saying that to each other. To our children and to our parents, to our siblings and our friends, to our spouses and so much to ourselves. Please allow me to make a mistake. Please give me space to fall. Please don't expect me to always be strong. Please don't disappoint it. Won't be disappointed when I don't know the answer. Please allow me to be human. Because that's all I am. And when it gets too much, and life is too difficult. Take the words of Rebbe Nachman of Bratzlav to heart. 
Dear God, grant me the ability to be alone. May it be my custom to go outdoors each day, among the trees and grasses, among all growing things, and there may I be alone and enter into prayer to talk with the one to whom I belong. May I express there everything in my heart, and may all the foliage of the field, all grasses, trees, and plants awake at my coming, to send the powers of, powers of their life into the words of my prayer, so that my prayer and speech are made whole through the life and spirit of all growing things which are made as one by their transcendent source. May I then pour out the words of my heart before your presence like water, O God, and lift up my hands to you in worship on my behalf and that of my children and my friends, my parents, my spouse, my partners, my confidants, for they need me as much as I need them to give us space to fall and then to be offered a hand. To get back up again. <laughs> 